Uh, right, my name is Song Song. I'm a professor in computer science at UC Berkeley, the co-director of uh, a new campus-wide center at Berkeley called the uh, uh, Center for Responsible Decentralized Intelligence, RDI, and also founder at the Oasis Labs. Um, I mean, this, I think, is a very informal talk. So I'll talk about some new directions in decentralized programming and decentralized intelligence. So before that, I want to first uh, make an announcement. Some of you may have seen this uh, already. We just announced that uh, there will be, uh, so, so we are doing a ZKP Web3 hackathon, and that actually starts today. Uh, we already have more than 100 people signed up, even though it was just announced uh, uh, yesterday. So uh, I think uh, people are really excited about this. Uh, it's uh, March 1st to May 2nd. Uh, it's both virtual and in-person at UC Berkeley. And thanks to uh, great uh, partners and sponsors, we have actually up to 200,000 uh, plus in prizes. Uh, so it'll be really exciting. And we'll have great judges. Uh, many of them are from the ZKP MOOC uh, class. And uh, also, so I wanted to actually briefly mention about the hackathon is actually designed in a special way. Uh, so there are four hackathon tracks. And uh, with two goals, actually. The first one uh, is to actually demonstrate that every developer today can actually learn to use ZKP uh, technology to build uh, apps. So that's the ZK applications track. And then the second track is, uh, no, the, the second goal is actually quite, uh, I think it's quite special that I think fits with the ethos here very well as well, is that we wanted to, to demonstrate that through this decentralized collaboration, the community can actually come together to build the key technology and public goods in uh, in Zernage, uh, in ZKP. And so this is, uh, applies to three tracks. One is ZK Bridge. Uh, some of you may have heard about our work on ZK Bridge using Zernage proofs, uh, succinct proofs to actually build a truly trustless and permissionless bridge that provides the best security. Uh, and uh, so there's a track for that to bring the community together and to actually build. Uh, we hope that at the end of the hackathon, the community can actually come together, bring different pieces for ZK Bridge to really have a community built ZK Bridge. Uh, and uh, for ZK Circuits track, uh, the community come together to build optimized uh, circuits. Uh, and, uh, and then the ZK Benchmark track, I think also is, a, is something that's very much needed in this community is to actually have a coherent uh, benchmark frameworks to benchmark different uh, ZKP frameworks uh, and so on. And again, we, um, we actually have a ZK harness built uh, that the community can integrate different uh, ZK frameworks and also workloads into it. So that will be exciting to really have the community come together to build that as well. So that's why I wanted to spend just a little bit of time to talk about this, especially given this audience that's really excited about ZK. Uh, and the hackathon is hosted by Berkeley RDI. As I mentioned, it's actually a campus-wide center at Berkeley across uh, School of Engineering, has business school and law school and so on. And then we do a lot of interdisciplinary research and you can find uh, the more research uh, information on the RDI website, including the ZK Bridge that I mentioned. And also, for example, we have developed a new optimistic rollup uh, that's uh, EVM native that actually provides the best security. And also, uh, for many of you may be interested in some of our MOOCs um, that uh, RTI has been leading and together in collaboration with the many other institutions, including the first DeFi MOOC and we have an entrepreneurship in Web3 MOOC. And for people here, I think the most relevant is the ZKP MOOC that's running currently. And we have 3,500 uh, people uh, enrolled across the globe and the number is actually growing every day. Um, and also for people who are interested in building startups, um, at Berkeley we also have a Berkeley Blockchain Accelerator that has uh, incubated um, over 85 teams that has raised follow-on funding for over $450 million. So we have cohorts uh, every year, so we do encourage people to join if you are interested uh, as well. Okay, so, so uh, that's the uh, introduction about the ZKP Hackathon. So today I want to talk about something um, actually quite different, like given that there's a lot of ZK talks here, so I won't actually talk about our projects in ZK, so I wanted to talk about some, some new work that we have been doing in a much more, um, uh, I guess, the, the more general direction of what I call decentralized data science and decentralized intelligence. So as we all know, data is a key driver for modern economy and uh, uh, the uh, lifeblood of AI machine learning. But of course, as we all know, a lot of this data is uh, very sensitive. 
And for example, our earlier work, we have shown that uh, even you know, when we train these large language models, actually from these models, you can actually extract information from uh, sensitive information from the training data. Um, but anyway, so, so with all the sensitive data, um, there has been unprecedented, uh, unprecedented challenges for both individuals and uh, institutions. And hence, there's an urgent need for a new paradigm that I call a responsible data economy. And uh, there are several uh, important goals and principles that I would say for uh, a responsible data economy. Uh, first is to establish and enforce data rights. Uh, this can help um, establish a foundation of data economy and help prevent misuse and abuse of data. And uh, it's important to ensure fair distribution of value created from data. For example, users should be able to gain sufficient benefit from their data. And also, most importantly, we, want to in, we, we need to enable efficient data use to maximize social welfare and economic efficiency. And uh, in academia and uh, industry, there has been rapid adv advancement in what I call responsible data technologies. Essentially, these technologies, um, they help solve different aspects of the problems. Um, when bring together, they can really enable uh, what I call responsible data use, inclu including secure computing, um, both uh, using secure hardware as well as cryptographic techniques such as MPC, FHE, and so on. You've heard some of the talks in the morning on this. Um, this helps protect the computation process from leaking sensitive information. And then differential privacy uh, to help uh, protect the computation output from leaking sensitive information about the input. And with further learning, that helps to keep data on um, uh, owners' devices uh, while enabling distributed or decentralized model training and data analytics and so on. And distributed ledger can help provide an immutable log uh, for users' data rights and how data has been utilized. And when we put all this together, uh, with Web3, we want to enable essentially a new paradigm uh, that we call data sovereignty. And this is in contrast to Web2, where in Web2, users are now in control of their data, and uh, it's a centralized control um, uh, by the platform, whereas in Web3, through decentralized identity and decentralized access control, and also we call policy-compliant decentralized computation, when we bring this all together, it can enable this new paradigm called data sovereignty. So here I want to give you some examples of some of our recent work uh, and uh, some future directions, how to actually make it easier to achieve um, these new paradigms and goals that I mentioned. So one thing I wanted to briefly mention is a recent uh, <clears throat> project that we launched uh, in partnership with the Meta um, and the Instagram, uh, which is the first uh, large-scale, uh, first of its kind, AI model fairness ass assessment um, that is privacy preserving. Um, and so, so first of all, AI model fairness assessment is uh, very important given AI models are now uh, ubiquitous and they make very important decisions uh, for users and so on. And people actually, the community has really been asking the question, for example, for Meta, for Instagram, their models for recommendations and so on, whether it's actually uh, fair, whether it has biases based on gender, race, and so on. So, and hence it's important to be able to uh, assess the fairness for these AI models. But in order to compute that, essentially, uh, you need information about users' sensitive attributes, race, gender, and so on, and also the model inference result for the users. And then, uh, use this information, you can compute these uh, AI model fairness. Given interest of time, I won't have I won't go into the details of how this is computed. Um, but as you can see here, then privacy is really important because um, essentially you need user sensitive attributes to actually compute uh, this AI model fairness. And um, so then what we did together with, with the Meta, and this actually now has been rolled out to all Instagram users, is that the user attribute, uh, sensitive attribute is, um, is collected by some Separate operator if they opt in, and then the information is actually spread uh, using uh, secure multi-party computation uh, with different, uh, several different independent entities called facilitators. For example, now we have several universities running these uh, as facilitators, and then and then also by utilizing homomorphic encryption uh, together uh, with Meta's model inference results, then in the end, and also by adding. 
some differential privacy and also zero knowledge proof for range proofs. All this put together, essentially, we can enable this uh, for the first time, this privacy preserving AI model fairness assessment. And as I mentioned, so this now actually has been rolled out to all uh, Instagram users. So it's really the first, uh, first of its kind large scale real world deployment. And so we have learned a lot from this experience. So um, one actually surprising experience that we learned is that people think about, right, these are uh, some advanced cryptography put together, but actually, the the time we spent developing the algorithms and the protocols is relatively short. The key challenge we have seen is actually develop and deploy these technologies for decentralized data science and responsible data use today is too expensive. So only a very small portion of the time is used to develop the cryptographic algorithms and so on. Um, but significant, most of the time has been used in actually the engineering time for doing system building and deployments, especially for this type of decentralized systems. And what we have learned is that there are many uh, challenges when you actually try to build and um, deploy these type of decentralized learning or decentralized data science solutions that's not handled by uh, typical, yeah, typical uh, development. For example, uh, user and access management and uh, this secure communication across different uh, independent entities, and how do you actually encapsulate uh, code reuse for these decentralized programs? So, very similar analogy is, for example, with um, uh, deep learning, without PyTorch and TensorFlow in the beginning uh, days, it's uh, it's a lot more work to actually even develop simple neural networks and train them, and and so on, um, because it didn't have uh, the right programming abstraction. Similarly. For we call this is decentralized programming that actually develop these decentralized systems. Um, we actually lack currently uh, the right programming abstractions to make decentralized programming easy. So that's essentially, um, oh, and also today it's very difficult for application developers to utilize these more advanced decentralized uh, cryptographic protocols as well. For example, even with, uh, um, uh, for example, federated learning, there are many, like a dozens of uh, uh, different uh, federal learning systems, but each one is all siloed and it's actually difficult. Uh, they are not composable. It's difficult for application developers to utilize them. So given these challenges, what we have developed is um, a new system called Colink. It's fully open source uh, now. Uh, Colink essentially develops various uh, programming abstractions and also develop an SDK to make it easy to solve exactly the kind of uh, challenges that I mentioned earlier uh, for developing decentralized applications and, um, and systems. So, uh, so Colink has built-in abstractions for handling decentralized identities, actually using essentially um, very much the Web3 like public key uh, <coughs> primitives, uh, and, develop, uh, and has built-in abstractions for private storage to make it easy to protect users' uh, data in a secure manner and has flexible, a flexible secure communication to handle communication across decentralized uh, entities. And uh, we develop uh, we call decentralized protocol encapsulation to make it uh, easy to encapsulate these decentralized uh, programs so that um, actually using the coding system, application developer using just one line in the application can instantiate and utilize these decentralized uh, solutions. And using this approach, we can significantly reduce the gap between protocol design and system development and deployments from many months to uh, just a couple of weeks. So for example, for the work that we did with the Meta, at the time we didn't have Colink, it took many months to develop. Um, but uh, with Colink, we can reduce that time to just a, a couple of weeks. And here is another uh, demo example uh, application to show the versatility of the coding system. So for example, people have talked about like with SSH, um, important servers, oftentimes people make mistakes or uh, you, like you also you don't, uh, so, so in general you want to actually have what's called the supervision mode where when someone is running commands on an SSH server, you want someone else to be able to simultaneously monitor and ensure that the commands actually uh, can be run and or, or can be rejected and so on. So with the coding system, it's not just for decentralized data science. You can make these type of things much easier as well. So uh, with just a, 
a couple of weeks instead of again spending a month, you can actually oh, we actually show that you can develop this called supervised SSH S3H uh, that you can actually use today to on your SSH server to then have um, uh, another user to uh, even from their phone with Telegram bots to uh, uh, to essentially monitor and uh, uh, supervise SSH sessions. Uh, of another remote guest. Um, and with the Colink is the programming, de uh, decentralized programming framework. And on top of that, so we have uh, developed CoLearn. It's really for decentralized uh, data science. It's a unified platform with uh, state-of-the-art uh, crypto, various cryptographic protocols uh, integrated, including uh, secure multi-party computation protocols for uh, machine learning training and, uh, and the different vector learning frameworks and um, uh, and also for uh, even for key management such as a proactive dynamic secret sharing uh, all these actually can be uh, they are integrated and also uh, can be de uh, developed uh, and utilized uh, very easily using the coding and coding system and with this approach essentially coding develops a new open source platform to make it easy for decentralized data science where again it, it bridges the gap between crypto uh, protocol design and real-world deployment um, to make it much easier and others are many too cheaper to deploy these new cryptographic protocols and also they are compos composable in the unified framework um, by utilizing a preset of carefully designed and standardized uh, decentralized programming applications and um, so with that it uh, colon can help accelerate research development and deployment of decentralized data science helps um, research and protocol designers, application developers, and also the, the whole communi community to benefit. And we hope that um, with uh, this uh, framework and platform, we can really bring the benefits of decentralized data science to everyone and to the whole society. And also it's currently being developed to enable uh, different individuals to participate in much larger scale of decentralized uh, uh, machine learning uh, training for large language models as well. So with that, um, you can go to codelearn.studio. Uh, studio. Uh, as I mentioned, it's fully open source. You can go there to learn more details. And uh, we hope to have the community to join this together to make it decentralized programming and decentralized data science uh, much, much easier. And um, with that, thank you. And also, uh, please help spread the word for the CKP hackathon and, uh, uh, and sign up for the hackathon. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? So I actually have a quick question. Uh, so what is kind of the privacy ramification for this architecture? Uh, privacy ramifications? No, so basically, um, you know, like what, what is the primary privacy ramifications for for um, you know for decentralized data science? Well, just maybe address the question more broadly. Uh, if that makes sense. Oh, so for example, as I, as I mentioned, like in the example of the work together with the Meta, so then in this case, no, for example, no single entity learns users. Uh, in the, the no single entity. Participating in a computation learns users' sensitive data. Uh, and like individual privacy, or what? What is what is actual guarantee here? If you have to get an output. So, so as I mentioned, it actually combines different technologies so that I can help protect privacy from different aspects, both in terms of secure computation and also yes, there's differential privacy added in there as well. So essentially, the framework pr provides the building blocks and the cryptographic protocols so the applications can more easily utilize them. So, so basically the, the protocol builders have to make sure that like, the output that they, that they give is, is not- They need to use the framework uh, right, okay, got it, got it. in the right way. Got it. Yes, right, great, thank you.